raise whatever questions you feel you'd like to raise this night. So again, Eamon, we're delighted to welcome you to Clonard. We thank you for taking our invitation and we're looking forward to your talk tonight. So you're welcome. Well, thank you very much indeed, Father Murta, for your kind invitation to come. And uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as I stand in Clonard tonight, I'm reminded of my late great friend, somebody you probably all know quite well from the columns of the Irish News, the late Jimmy Kelly, doyen of Irish journalism, who died just over a year ago, aged 103 months. And he did what we'd all love to do if we're spared to our century. On his 100th birthday, he sat down at a typewriter and hammered out his last column which was a brilliant achievement, went to a great party, and so on other three months. But Jimmy Kelly, in many ways, encapsulates the decade of centenaries, indeed the whole 20th century of strife and partition and turmoil on this island. And I use him by way of introduction because he often worshipped here in Clonard. And, of course, he was born in Cavendish Street in 1911. And his earliest memory was actually being brought to the window of Springfield Road RIC station because his father was a constable in the Royal Irish Constabulary from County Kilkenny. And his father brought this infant son, three or four years old, to the window on a chill autumn night in September 1914. And he pointed to Black Mountain which was aglow with bonfires, uh, a, a, sort of a, a sort of a series of bonfires on the hillside, as he later called his autobiography. And his father said, son, you'll always remember this night because Ireland has just got home rule. The Home Rule Bill had become an act in September 1914 for all Ireland and had been placed on the statute book. But of course, that Home Rule Bill was to be frozen in time by the Ulster Crisis, by the Great War, and eventually, when it crystallised, it would be um, the Government of Ireland Act 1920 and the partition of, I of Ireland. Jimmy also remembered, of course, in his early years, his parents talking about the McCann case, because in Cavendish Street, around 1910-1911, lived Mr and Mrs Alexander McCann. They were a mixed marriage. Alexander was a carpenter from Ballymena. His wife was a Presbyterian. They had married in a Presbyterian church, and they had two small children. This was the time of the papal decree, Ne Temere, which was applied to mixed marriages, really forcing the Protestant partner to bring up the children in the, the Catholic faith. And whatever happened, the McCanns split up. Uh, Mr. McCann disappeared forever with the two children under the age of three. His wife never saw them again. And she became a major factor in anti-home rule propaganda by the unionist parties as we enter that period of the home rule crisis in 1912. In fact, Joe Devlin, who was a collector in this church at some of its early uh, kind of masses uh, around 1911, famously said in the House of Commons that Mrs. McCann was the greatest asset to Ulster Unionism since King William himself. But nonetheless, it was a tragic case. She never saw her children again. And just last year, in fact, last spring, my door knocked in the college. And these two ladies in their 50s presented themselves and they said, we are the McCanns with American accents. We believe there was a spot of trouble about 100 years ago. And they revealed to me the mystery of Alexander McCann. They gave me photographs. He had taken ship for America, bringing his children aged one and three with him to Pittsburgh, USA, where he worked as a jobbing carpenter and had no further contact with Ireland or his wife. And I said, you must have been brought up in a very religious atmosphere with all these tensions of 1912, home rule, ne temere, and they, they said, we were brought up with absolutely no religion, which was interesting in light of the heat that the McCann case generated way back in 1910, 1912. So Jimmy heard that discussed, 
his father being a constable in the local barracks. And then he remembered his mother taking him into town around October, November 1914 in his baby pram and hearing the martial tramp of men as the Connacht Rangers, Catholics from the Falls, joined forces with Protestants from East and North Belfast to march to the, the docks to take ship for the battlefields of Europe and the Somme and the Dardanelles beyond. And then he remembered, as a child of five or six, hearing talk about the Easter Rising. His father took him to Dublin in June 1916 and he saw the still smouldering ruins of the GPO and the College of Surgeons, the rebel positions of the recent 1916 Rising. He was my living link with the Easter Rising. He could vividly recall, until he died last August, seeing this as a tiny eyewitness. And he also remembered whispered conversations uh, in his household. By now, Almeida Terrace on the Falls Road, now the Falls Women's Centre, beside Broadway huts where the Irish volunteers were drilling by 1914. And he remembered his father and mother talking about the, not just the death, but the execution of their neighbour, Mr. James Connolly, trade union organiser from Glenelina Terrace, a man who used to pat the young James on the head as he strode down the Falls Road to his busy Irish Transport and General Workers' Union office. He had been executed in a chair, already dying from gangrene, the result of his wounds in the rising in Kilmainham Jail in May 1916. Jimmy went on, of course, to cover the conflict on this island. The birth of Stormont, the fall of Stormont, the resurrection of Stormont. He used to always say, we used to always say in programs we made about him, Jimmy Kelly was there. And in many ways, his first five or six years encapsulate the period I'm talking about tonight. A period that impacted heavily on both communities uh, on this island and in this city at that particular time. And I want to start with a sequence. I want to start with a sequence of slides that are rather rare. I uncovered them in an old man's scrapbook a couple of years ago, and they relate to a particular event in West Belfast in February 1912, the 8th of February 1912, because on that day of our Lord, the rising star of the British government the British Liberal Cabinet, Winston Spencer Churchill, First Lord of the Admiralty, agreed to come to the Citadel of Unionism, Belfast, to speak initially in the Ulster Hall, another kind of iconic Unionist meeting place, in support of Home Rule for Ireland. And you can see the background, the artist's impression of John Redmond, the upper-class leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party, the Nationalist Party, the Home Rule Party, having a word in Winston's ear before he entrained for Belfast in February 1912. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Of course, then as now, people had their heroes and their hit figures, and Carson was strung up in effigy in the falls in Ardoyne in advance of the Churchill visit, just as Churchill and Joe Devlin, the MP for the Falls, were, if you like, burnt in effigy on the Shanko. Can we see the next one, please? And this is the famous scene. Denied the Ulster Hall, Churchill and the Ulster Liberal Association agreed to relocate the meeting to a much better place, a place called Paradise on the edge of the bog meadows in West Belfast, the Belfast Celtic Football Club's uh, football pitch. And it was there that Churchill was to address a, a, a mixed liberal and nationalist audience, all of them home rulers, who wanted a measure of self-government for Ireland, but within the British Empire. The leader of that small liberal party was a man who was at loggerheads with his, with his 30,000 strong workforce. His name was W.H. Perry, Lord Perry, the architect of Titanic, 
which, had, which was to sink three months later. And of course, the owner of Harland and Wolf. He had been a liberal unionist. He had gravitated to a pro-home rule position, to the anger of the unionist entrepreneurs and captains of industries who dominated the industries of the Lagan Valley, shipbuilding, linen, and engineering. And as Churchill arrived at the Northern Counties station from the Larne boat, he and his beautiful wife Clementine were pelted with dead fish. They hadn't yet experienced shipyard confetti that would follow. And they made their way up York Road, York Street, Royal Avenue to the Grand Central, Belfast's most sumptuous hotel, for breakfast and luncheon, attended by the glitterati of Ulster liberalism, mainly Protestant Presbyterian ministers like the Reverend J.B. Armour of Balamani, uh, lawyers like Sir Samuel Keatley and Sir Charles Brett, and of course Perry, the shipbuilder, in the chair. The problem arose when Churchill tried to leave the Grand Central at about noon, 12.30, on that windswept, rain-swept day in February 1912, because outside the thin blue line of the Royal Irish Constabulary, including probably Jimmy Kelly's father, were trying to hold back a hostile mob which had marched from the shipyards and were really demanding Churchill's head. At one stage, Winston inside heard them singing Rule Britannia and was naive enough to think this was in celebration of his role as First Lord of the British Admiralty when he was dissuaded by uh, some of his local advisors who said, no, no, I, I don't think that's why they're singing it. And finally he emerged after luncheon and began furtively to approach the car. You can just see him there. His is the highlighted face, a wan smile upon his face. Maybe I'll show it to you. Winston Churchill approaching his waiting car in Royal Avenue. Massive crowd thronging Donegal Place, Royal Avenue, Corn Market, all the usual places where perhaps even this Saturday um, marches and demonstrations overspill. And as he made his way towards the car, a couple of roughnecks broke their way through and they managed to upend the car on two wheels. And Churchill had just got inside. Now, it looked as though Winston was not going to live to fight the Second World War at this point. And suddenly, a shrill Belfast voice rang out, Mind that woman! Mind that woman! Because his wife Clementine was seated in the car. And the car was placed down again on terra firma and was able to escape via the back streets to the nationalist Donegal Road and Celtic Park and Churchill was spared to face down Hitler in 1939. But it wasn't all over for Churchill, if you see the next slide. First of all, the cartoons of the period. This one depicting Carson, if you like, ratcheting up the tension with the Rome Rules scare. One of the Unionist slogans, widely, if you like, believed by masses of Ulster Protestants, was that Home Rule would be Rome Rule. That, home, that a Home Rule Parliament would discriminate against them. And of course, the economic argument that a Home Rule Parliament would, if you like, undermine the North's industrial prosperity, possibly by the introduction of tariff, tariff walls. And that Belfast role in that great free trade area of the British Empire, which allowed Harland and Wolfe and Gallagher's to sell their ships and tobacco from Canada to India to Australia to the colonies of Africa would come to an end when John Redmond became Prime Minister of a government in Dublin. Can we have the next one, please? There was a massive troop concentration around West Belfast. In fact, Queen Victoria's uh, Grand nephew Count Gleichen, good German name, Count Gleichen, was placed in charge of several battalions of troops around Celtic Park itself as tensions rose. Next one, please. 
the grand old man of home rule, William York Gladstone. Until 1885, Gladstone had been a unionist with a small U. But you remember the first liberal prime minister, a, a high church Anglican, a man with a very, very firm moral compass. Gladstone famously said at the start of his administration, my mission is to pacify Ireland, dealing first with the church question, then with the land question. And by 1885, he was persuaded by the success of Parnell's Home Rule Party, led by this Anglo-Irish landlord from County Wicklow. The Nationalists now commanded 85 of the 100 or so Irish seats, including a bare majority of seats in Ulster, including West Belfast, seats in Tyrone, Fermanagh, and so on. Gladstone read in that success of Parnell the fixed desire of a nation, clearly and constitutionally expressed, and he was to respond with Home Rule. But as he responded with the first and unsuccessful Home Rule Bill of 1886, his face, which had once been on the, um, in the portraits of the Reform Club and Royal Avenue, would be relegated to the bottom of chamber pots. Can we have the next one, please? Lord Perry, forever associated with those great floating liners, including Titanic, Church, the man who invited Churchill. Next one, please. The great marquee imported from Scotland for the Churchill meeting. Something like 40,000 people attended this massive home rule meeting, graced by a British statesman on the Falls Road. Next one, please. Next one, please. Appeals to the Orangemen of Belfast to show restraint as tensions rose in January, February 1912. Next one, please. Does this sound familiar? Um, next one, please. And there's the three-leaf shamrock. Here we have Lord Perry, Winston Churchill, the liberal home ruler, who had crossed the floor from the Tory benches. A man whose father, Lord Randolph, in 1886, had consecrated the Ulster Hall as a place of pilgrimage for Ulster Unionists. It was Lord Randolph Churchill, a brilliant, if unstable, Tory politician, who gave the Unionists of the North their watchword, Ulster will fight, and Ulster will be right. And not only that, at that famous meeting in the Ulster Hall, when he addressed the Orange Lodges, the MPs, the Unionist clubs, all classes of Ulster Protestant, he proclaimed the bands of a marriage between Ulster Unionism, emerging for the first time, and the great British Conservative Party, based on the empire, based on an identity of interest. That, if you like, phalanx would continue right through that Home Rule crisis, right down to the partition of Ireland in 1922. And finally, John Redmond, a man who shared so much in common with Churchill and indeed the Ulster Unionists, because Redmond, from an upper-class background, had started his career as a clerk on the floor of the House of Commons. He was from an old English Norman background in County Wexford. And he revered the British Parliament as the perfection of democracy. Apart from that, he believed passionately in the British Empire. He traveled throughout the empire. He'd married a Protestant Australian woman. And he believed that Home Rule would bind Ireland more closely to Westminster and the British Empire. And so when Redmond spoke on the Falls Road in October 1914 in support of recruitment in the Clonard Cinema, two flags would fly from the rostrum. The green flag emblazoned with the harp, the flag of the Home Rule Movement, and the Union Jack. And when Churchill traveled up the Falls Road on that day in 1912, in his opening lines at Celtic Park, he congratulated the people of the Falls for the bright profusion of Union Jacks, which went all the way from Castle Street to Celtic Park. Can we, and here we have Churchill, just holding that one, back to that one a second, please. 
Churchill mounting the platform in Celtic Park. Churchill was whiter, the blood drained from his face than he had ever been on a public platform before. Royal Avenue had been a traumatic experience for him, but even more for, so for his wife, who a week later had a miscarriage. Such was the, the angst on that day in Belfast. And of course, you see his wife, the big black hat on the platform with him. You see Lord Perry looking up to the First Lord of the Admiralty. No man was better placed to bring orders to Belfast shipyard as the British state geared up, building dreadnoughts for the forthcoming conflict with Germany, which we know, of course, now as the Great War. The naval race was underway. There were tensions in the Balkans. The Kaiser had a policy of Weltpolitik, interfering throughout the globe, asserting German power. And we were on well on the way through the great alliance systems to the Great War, which broke out on the 4th of August, 1914. Churchill's main problem in that speech was to get over the words of his famous Unionist father. 26 years, 24 years before, a lifetime before, when he had said Ulster would fight. And he used a famous phrase, Ulster should fight for the glory and honor of Ireland. Then, truly, he said, Ulster will fight and Ulster will be right. Addressing the fears of the Protestants of Ulster, he rejected the view that a Home Rule Parliament would discriminate against them or undermine their civil and religious liberty, as the Ulster Covenant was to proclaim later that year. On the other hand, he said, there will be a system of checks and balances. There will be two chambers. Protestants would dominate the upper house, the Senate. There you would have the landlords, the Church of Ireland, the business interests of the North, ensuring fair play for all under the Union Jack within the Empire. And afterwards, heckled by suffragettes who had pursued him all the way by boat and train to Larne, he was forced to repair through the back streets to the Larne boat. And this time, he experienced shipyard confetti, nuts and bolts rained down upon Churchill and his harried wife and Lord Perry by members of their own workforce. The nationalist press proclaimed the Churchill visit as a great event, a great success. He had gone to the citadel of loyalism and proclaimed the justness of the Irish cause and the Home Rule cause. But behind the scenes, Churchill's experience in this city in 1912 was to trigger a rethink. He began a journey which he'd already begun in private in contemplation of some kind of special concessions for the Protestant North. He talked about the exclusion of certain Ulster counties. By 1916, that phrase would harden into the idea of partition. By 1914, Churchill would recommend county option, the exclusion of the more Protestant counties of Ulster from Home Rule for a limited period, perhaps six years. Redmond up against the buffers because he was relying on this liberal Home Rule Alliance to deliver an Irish Parliament was forced to concede, as he put it, as the price of peace. But Edward Carson was to reject the concession of what would have been a four-county temporary division, with the four counties reverting to an All-Ireland Parliament within six years. Because Carson said, in his famous lawyerly phrase, it was a sentence of death with a stay of execution for six years. And so Ireland approached the First World War in an atmosphere of intense tension. Indeed, Ireland came within a nace of civil war by that stage. You see if we have another one? That's it, thank you very much. I wanted to focus on the Churchill visit as something that happened a mile from here, at the very beginning of the Home Rule crisis. 
and through Jimmy Kelly's eyes introduce a series of related events which were part of that gathering momentum around home rule. But where did this idea of home rule, an Irish parliament in Dublin dominated by the nationalists come from? It really went back, of course, to Daniel O'Connell, to the repeal movement of the 1830s and 40s. O'Connell wanted the restoration of the old 18th century Irish parliament with limited powers. His, his baton was passed on to Isaac Butt, a former Ulster Orangeman, an evangelical Protestant, some would say an enlightened conservative, certainly not a nationalist, who was born in a manse in County Donegal. Isaac Butt believed if Fenianism was to be diffused, if revolutionary nationalism was to be terminated, then Irish men must be given control of domestic affairs, agriculture, industry, education, but the important matters, the commanding heights would remain in London. With control of peace and war, the Crown, foreign policy, even finance reserved to London. So this would be very much what they have at Stormont today, you might say. And of course, it was Parnell's success in 1885 that brought Home Rule to the very forefront of British politics. Gladstone split his own party, the Liberals, on the justness of Home Rule. He was convinced that Home Rule would allow Irish people to express a local patriotism, which would deal with the emotional baggage of centuries of Irish struggle for independence and for land, and that somehow Irish men would take their place within the empire as long as they had these local levers of power. John Redmond shared that view when he came to the chairmanship of the Irish Home Rule Party in 1900. And that reminds us that Gladstone failed. Aged 86, he introduced his second Home Rule Bill into the House of Commons. Now there may be people here who rejoice in the age of 86, but when we think of Gladstone, he had a little tip for us. His hobby was chopping down trees, which he still did at 86. But even for a man who felled trees, he faced a problem at the heart of British politics. The House of Lords had a veto power over Home Rule and all legislation. And traditionally, since time immemorial, the House of Lords was a Tory construct, the dukes and lords and earls of ancient lineage. And they saw an Irish Parliament Home Rule as the first chink in the armour of the great British Empire. If Ireland was let go, India would follow. In fact, they were very prophetic. That's really what happened between 1922 and 1947, when India became a republic. So the Home Rule question eventually was placed on the back burners. The Tories returned to power, and Ireland became the touchstone of British politics. It was the litmus test. The Tories were vehemently opposed to Irish self-government. Lord Salisbury said he would sooner give home rule to Hottentots than to the people of Ireland. And Lord Salisbury was Prime Minister until uh, the end, the, the beginning of the 20th century. The Home Rule Party was split after the downfall of Parnell in 1891 into warring factions. So it was only when Redmond assumed control in 1900 that you had a united Home Rule Party once again trying to get Home Rule back on track, rallying the Irish people to the old cause. And of course, while it remained an item on the Liberal agenda, it only moved to the top of that agenda when the Liberals faced a major crisis by 1910. Why did they face a crisis? They came to power with a landslide, rather like Tony Blair's in 1906. They piloted a policy of liberal reform, old age pensions, national insurance acts, 
school meals for necessitous children. The new liberals were the, the progressive forces. The Tories were the stupid party. Maybe they still are. But as it was, the House of Lords decided that they were going to, if you like, they were going to mediate the legislation of the Liberal government. They were going to block it. So they, sh they threw out this act and that act. And then finally, in 1910, the Lords made a big mistake. They threw out the People's Budget, which was the um, template of David Lloyd George, a popular Chancellor of the Exchequer. It threatened to impose a super tax on the rich to pay for reform. Asquith, the new Liberal Prime Minister, went to the country twice in 1910, looking for a mandate. In the end, he hobbled back with a majority of two. He couldn't do much with that. So he turned his eyes to the serried ranks of the Home Rule Party. There was John Redmond and his 80-plus MP standing where Parnell had stood 25 years before. They cut a deal. The Unionist led by Edward Carson called it a corrupt bargain. In return for national support for the Liberal reforms, Asquith would introduce a third Home Rule Bill for all Ireland. But he would do something else. He would remove the veto of the House of Lords. This was achieved by the Parliament Act of 1911. Thereafter, the Lords could only hold up Home Rule for two years, after which it automatically became law. So John Redmond told people in the Clonard Cinema and in Dublin in 1912, trust the old party and home rule next year. And nationalism became more solid and consolidated than it had ever been. In Ulster, that was largely the achievement of one man, we Joe Devlin. The pocket Demosthenes, as they called him, a small man with a mane of dark hair, born into grinding poverty in Hamill Street at the foot of the Falls Road, his parents having come of evicted farming stock on the lock shore of County Tyrone. His father was a Jarvin. But he had, they went to the Christian Brothers in Barrick Street. He became a barman in Kelly Sellers. And by sharp native intelligence, he became a journalist. And in 1902, had become the secretary of the United Irish League, which is the Home Rule Organization, and a Home Rule MP. He realized that in the North were Catholics, and people thought in sectarian terms in those days, Catholics were about 44% of the population of the nine counties. And he decided they needed wakened up. The Land League had not made much progress in Ulster. The land question was not as fraught here as in other parts of Ireland. And so he revivified a much older organization, the ancient order of Hibernian, sometimes called the Green Orangemen, with their roots away back in the violent stricken fields of Mid-Ulster at the end of the 1790s. The Hibernians were placed on a new footing. They were brought within the orbit of the Home Rule Party, and Devlin became the Grand Master. Soon, they were 120,000 strong, with lodges or divisions across the north and much further afield. Devlin was now regarded under the Liberal government as Chief Secretary for Ireland. He got his friends, one of them a Belfast doctor, Sir Alexander Dempsey from Clifton Street, in the news this week, knighted. He became Sir Alexander Dempsey, a local GP. Devlin was a powerful figure but also a man to be feared by the Unionist masses. Because in their eyes, Devlin had created a Catholic sectarian society to match the serried ranks of the Orange Lodges. Just as Orangeism had become the social cement of the new Unionism, linking the big house, the shipyard magnate, the linen lord, with the small farmer and manual worker, so Hibernianism, if you like, um, galvanized the Catholics of Ulster into a major political force. And by 1910, Redmond, Dillon, and Devlin 
the leaders of the Home Rule Party, seemed within sight of the promised land. Nothing could stop the Home Rule ship gliding into the harbour by the autumn of 1914. But of course they had reckoned without the Dublin lawyers or Edward Carson, they had reckoned without the ex-soldier and stockbroker Captain James Craig, who had learned his meticulous military-style organisation in the battlefields of South Africa during the Boer War. James Craig had a penchant in the Boer War for drawing up, meticulously drawing up, railway timetables. Can you think of anything more boring? And yet, it was the skill he brought to bear in organising the Ulster Covenant of 1912, the Ulster Volunteer Force of 1914, and the whole resistance movement. James Craig, of course, was, as the historian Jonathan Barden reminds us, signally uncharismatic. But he had his finger firmly on the orange pulse. He knew what the market would bear in Ballina Mallard and the Shankill Road. And he was to talent spot a much more able, a much more dynamic, a much more silver-tongued politician the Dublin lawyer Edward Carson. Carson, of course, was the archetypal Irish Unionist, born in Dublin into the Cromwellian gentry of County Galway. His mother was Isabella Lambert of Castle Lambert, County Galway, one of the big houses of Georgian Ireland, planted there by Cromwell after the Civil War of the 1640s. It was from his mother that he learned his respect for the Union, for the Empire, for the Reformed Faith, and for, in particular, the landed interest whose cause he was to champion. But he wasn't an illiberal man. He began his career as a member of the Liberal Party supporting Gladstone. But he broke with Gladstone, like so many Protestant liberals, over home rule. He would become MP for Trinity College. He would become a Crown Prosecutor against the Land League. He would become the Conservative Party's Irish expert in the years before 1910, spending his mornings in the Old Bailey and his afternoons in the House of Commons as Solicitor General for Great Britain. And in that capacity, he drew attention to himself. In 1910, he was invited by Craig to lead the Irish Unionist Party, a group of MPs within the Tories, but they were mainly from the North. Carson was the lawyer with the Dublin accent. To show you how different Carson was from the generality of Ulster Unionists, we have to consider his first cousin, perhaps his favourite cousin, Mary Butler, born into that West of Ireland aristocracy. She joined the Gaelic League, she became a nationalist, she Gaelicised her name to Myra de Butler, and she was present at a meeting in Dublin in 1904, chaired by Arthur Griffith, Griffith wanted to form a new radical separatist nationalist party which would carry North and South together. He believed in the idea of dual monarchy. Let's keep the king. The king of England can be the king of Ireland, but let's get Irish independence. So we'll give the unionists the crown and the nationalist independence. And he said to the, his assembled gathering, a very small group, a very small party, which would achieve very little before 1916. What will we call ourselves? Up spake Carson's cousin, Myra de Butler. We will call ourselves something that means self-reliance. She was very much public school. Something that means we ourselves. We shall call ourselves Sinn Féin. So it was Carson's first cousin who invented the name Sinn Féin for Griffith's new party. Now she said she was very fond of her cousin Ned. There was only one thing she couldn't stand about him. And no, you haven't guessed it. His terrible Dublin accent. That's what she couldn't stand. And this was the Carson who was to front Ulster Unionism after 1910. But for Carson, Ulster was a weapon, it was never a cause. 
He was by birth, by blood, by education, a member of that privileged southern Protestant minority. Carson's aim was to save what he always called to his dying day, my own people in Galway, in Cork, in Dublin, that 10% south of the Boyne. For him, Ulster represented a weapon. The critical mass of Ulster Protestants, 57% in the whole province, the critical mass of northern industry on the Lagan and the Ban. He would use these in the scales against the massive vote for the Irish nationalists in the whole of Ireland. And he would seek the support of the British Conservatives, now led by effectively an Ulster man, Andrew Bonner Law. Bonner Law the son of a Presbyterian minister for Coleraine. For Bonner Law, Ulster was the key to the empire and to the revival of Tory fortunes. He famously declared at Blenheim Palace in 1912, at a great unionist meeting against Home Rule, there are things stronger than parliamentary majorities. And he wasn't talking about whiskey. So we have a sense of escalating tensions. Craig organized resistance. The covenant of 1912, harking back to earlier covenants, was the Presbyterian way of reminding God whose side he was on. Harking back to the 1643 Scots covenant, but very importantly, signed by 470,000 men and women across Ulster and among exiles in Britain and elsewhere, it invoked the use of force. They were prepared to use all means which may be necessary to defeat um, the conspiracy to establish a Home Rule Parliament in Ireland. Watching in the wings, of course, was a small underground revolutionary movement, the Irish Republican Brotherhood. It had very little support. It perhaps had two or three thousand members in Ireland and in America, where its organization was known as Clan na Gael. And the American Irish looked back in anger at the famine and the evictions of the Victorian age. Now, of course, something else had happened in Ireland in the 1890s, early 1900s. All over Europe, nationalists were beginning to rediscover their own language. The Croats, the Poles, the Italians, minority races within the Austrian Empire, struggling to be free. The Jews from that great diaspora in the early centuries AD. They were reviving their languages. In Ireland, two men had the same idea. Dr. Douglas Hyde, an academic, the son of a Church of Ireland rector in County Roscommon, and a northerner, a product of St. Malachy's College in Belfast, Owen McNeill, born in Glenarm in the Antrim Glens, becoming a professor of history, a cultural nationalist. They set up in 1893 the Gaelic League, Conran the Gaelic. Their aim was to revive Irish as a spoken language. It was not only spoken by about 10% along the western seaboard. It had been finally killed off by the famine and the death of a million people who were mainly native speakers. Douglas Hyde wanted to de-Anglicise Ireland. He believed that Ireland was already a cultural nation. It was a small step from that concept to arguing that Ireland should become a nation state. And soon, by 1910, thousands of people in cities and towns were attending language classes and fashioner. They were going to school to the Gaelic League. The Gaelic League created a new atmosphere, a new vibrancy, despite the rise of Home Rule. And significantly, the Home Rule Party took little interest in the Irish language. This was a non-political activity. It informed the GAA. It informed Arthur Griffith's tiny movement, Sinn Féin. Griffith wanted to abstain from Westminster. Griffith wanted to win international support for an Irish state, an Irish state run by Irishmen in charge of Irish affairs, as he called it. Sinn Féin rose and fell. But in Belfast, in the early years of the 20th century, 
Two men were laboring away in the vineyard of Irish republicanism. Two men from very different backgrounds. Dennis McCullough, the son of a publican in the Falls Road, who had a music shop in Howard Street, and his friend Bulmer Hobson, a Protestant journalist from Hollywood County Down. They decided they wanted to revive revolutionary nationalism, to breathe new life into the IRB, to wrest it from the dead hand of leaders who were discredited and drink sodden in the speakeasies of New York and the salons of Paris. By 1908, they had joined forces with another man, an old Fenian from Dungannon called Thomas J. Clark, who had a little shop in Dublin and who wanted to see an Irish rebellion for freedom before he died. Together, they revamped and revived the Irish Republican Brotherhood. But there was one problem. The mass of the people had no interest in republicanism. They wanted home rule. They rallied to the rallies of Joe Devlin and John Redmond, who made royal progresses throughout Ireland in these years. Home rule was the zenith of Irish nationalist expectations. However, this small group realized that they were awaiting an opportunity. They harked back to Wolf Tone when they looked back into the past. England's difficulty, they said, is Ireland's opportunity. And of course, the Ulster Crisis, the rise of Carson's army, the covenant followed by the UVF would provide that opportunity. It was that old boy of St. Malachy's College, Owen McNeil, who caught it in one line. In an article he wrote, a seminal article in the Gaelic League Journal on Clive Sullish in November 1913. He called it The North Began. He was echoing the words of Thomas Davis, the young Ireland poet and a Protestant. The North Began, the North held on uh, for strife of native land till Ireland rose and curbed her foes. God bless the northern land. In McNeil's view, Carson's army, the UVF, had against all the odds led the way. They had blazed a trail of defiance against the British government and the British parliament. They seemed to be emulating the example of their forebears in the 1790s, in the days of Wolfe Tone and the United Irishman. Patrick Pierce, until then a cultural nationalist, whose school was supported by one of the Belfast industrialists, Alec Wilson. He sent cheques for 500 pounds regularly down to 1916 to support St. Enda's bilingual school in Dublin. But Patrick Pierce was to write, a nationalist without a rifle, was a much more ridiculous figure than an orange man with one. And so there was an admiration in the IRB and in that minority section of Irish nationalism for the initiative of Carson. Michael Laffan, the historian, summed it up. Carson had reignited the Fenian flame. No, he didn't mean to do it. He was a unionist, he was an imperialist, but he was kicking against all the traces. And by supporting the illegality of the UVF, the Tory party, in the words of one constitutional export, expert, had strained the bonds of the British Constitution between 1912 and 14. When historians of conservatism, or conservative leaders today look back, they might mention Disraeli, and they might mention Churchill, but nobody ever mentions Andrew Bonner Law, who passed into history as the unknown Prime Minister. He only held office for six months before his death in the early 1920s. So we have another tradition of nationalism. And of course, MacNeill's article resulted within days in the formation of the Irish Volunteers, a second volunteer army, which soon mushroomed to 200,000 strong south. Both these armies were drilling, they were marching, they were counter-marching, against a background of rhetorical violence. Poor old Churchill hadn't much luck in these days. He was speaking in the House of Commons in 1913 when an Ulster Unionist MP called Ronald McNeill, 
from Cushendun. He later became Lord Cushendun, lifted a heavy metal-edged book and dropped it from a great height on Winston Churchill's bald head, actually drawing blood. That's the background against which mobilization and private armies will emerge. But of course, Carson, the lawyer with the Dublin accent, the destroyer of Oscar Wilde, his old university fellow, was to give Ulster Unionism a status and a standing in British politics which it never enjoyed before or indeed since. And as mobilization gave way to gun running by the spring of 1914, the Larne gun running, the Curra mutiny, which proved to Asquith that this weak liberal government, at sixes and sevens on home rule anyway, could not really trust the British army to enforce home rule. Then came the Hoth gun running in the last days of peace in July, except there the King's own Scottish borderers opened fire, killing three people. And this was contrasted in nationalist Ireland with the kid gloves at Larne a few months earlier. One thing about the Germans, they gave guns to everyone. They were not discriminating in that regard, as they saw the Irish question as a valuable diversion for um, the British government, as the storm clouds, the war clouds, loomed over Europe. There were other movements as well, which we'll mention briefly. The Irish Citizen Army. James Connolly, of course, gave a new credo to the Irish unemployed. The sort of uh, message of socialism, influenced by the two ends. John Mitchell, from his Edinburgh underprivileged childhood, and Karl Marx. The cause of labour, Connolly said, is the cause of Ireland. The cause of Ireland is the cause of labour. And Connolly, of course, by 1914, hoped that the workers of the world would refuse to march to the drumbeat of the Kaisers of the Kings and that socialist revolution would sweep the globe. But he was wrong. When the war broke out, the German working classes, the British working classes, the Irish working classes followed the crowned heads of Europe to slaughter on the battlefields. And this pushed James Connolly and his Irish citizen army to a much more revolutionary position. Now Connolly was thinking of a Custer's last stand in Dublin for an Irish workers' republic. And of course, the founder of that citizen army, 200 ex-British soldiers, sharpshooters, was not James Connolly himself. It was an Ulsterman, an Ulster Protestant, the son of a British military hero, a man called Captain Jack White, DSO, from Brechain in County Antrim. White's father, General Sir George White, was one of the most decorated British heroes in military history. He had been honoured for his role in the Boer War. If you go to Brechain today, probably this weekend especially, there are two bands called the White Memorial Band. Don't make the mistake of thinking they're called after Jack White of the Irish Citizen Army. They're both called after his father. But Jack White was an interesting man. He embraced socialism. He embraced republicanism. And during the great Dublin lockout of 1913, he founded a workers' defence force, the Irish Citizen Army. And they would play their role under Connolly in the 1916 Rising. There's another Ulster man in all this as well. Again, from a big house background. His name was Sir Roger Casement. He was brought up in the Adair Arms Hotel in Ballymena, where his family had rooms. He was orphaned in his early teens and sent off to the big white mansion outside Ballycastle, where Prince Charles visits Maharan Temple House to be reared. He was sent to the diocesan school for education now Ballymena Academy. He was apprenticed to a shipping line as a young man and then entered the British consular service. He served the crown in two empires, in the heart of Africa and the Congo and in the heart of South America, exposing the brutalization of native peoples, notably by the King of the Belgians in South Africa. Only a few years ago, a solicitor 
in a practice in Royal Avenue, came across an old desk. And in that desk were two things. Roger Casement's Irish Volunteer Revolver and a batch of photographs of mutilated, mutilated Negro people who had arms and legs chopped off for not harvesting rubber quickly enough under the Belgian Empire. And Casement had brought these back as part of his evidence before a humanitarian inquiry uh, in the House of Commons. Casement turned his face against the whole concept of empire, embraced Irish nationalism, became a major figure in the Gaelic League, attended the first lens of Antrim Fesh in 1904, and by 1912 was gravitating towards Irish separatism. He was one of that very small group of Ulster Protestants who actually refused to sign the covenant, but produced a counter-covenant. Their covenant supported home rule. Their covenant condemned Carsonism, and their covenant called for friendship and goodwill with our Roman Catholic fellow countrymen. Very recently, I went to County Cavan, where people came from Belturbet and Mount Nugent and Kilishandra with the covenants their great-grandfathers had signed. These people felt very, if you like, alienated by Ulster Unionism because their counties had been hived off in 1921, even though nine counties were offered to Craig as the area of Northern Ireland. He said, no, we want six counties. We couldn't possibly govern nine in a stable situation. And these Cavan Covenanters, Presbyterian, Church of Ireland, Methodist, brought these, co these covenants with pride, but also with wounded pride because of what had happened. But when they read the other covenant, the covenant of J.B. Armour and Lord Perry and nameless tenant farmers from the yards of County Down and Roger Casement and Jack White, they actually said, we like this covenant better. This emphasis on friendship and goodwill with our Catholic fellow countrymen speaks to us today in a new post-conflict island. It's very interesting. But of course, those events the gun running, the rise of the private armies, would bring Ireland to the brink of civil war by 1914. The last, I suppose, act in all of this drama was the Buckingham Palace Conference that summer. The king himself intervened. George V was keen to prevent civil war among his Irish subjects. And so, George Mitchell-like, he brought the combatants to his palace in London. There was Craig and Carson, there was Redmond and Devlin, there was Asquith and Bonalaw. But of course, as Churchill put it, they couldn't agree on the area to be partitioned, and they couldn't agree whether partition would be temporary, as the nationalists wanted, or permanent, as Carson wanted. In the end, Churchill said, the conference became bogged down in the muddy byways of Fermanagh and Tehran. And within days, it was eclipsed by the greater conflict. The shots in Sarajevo and the Balkans had sparked the First World War. The great alliances fell into place. And soon, John Redmond on the nationalist side and Edward Carson on the unionist side were urging their armies, the Irish volunteers and the UVF, to go wherever the firing line extends, in the same uniform, under the same flags, but with vastly different aspirations. The Redmondites wanted to prove that Ireland was fit for all Ireland home rule. The Carsonites wanted to prove that Ulster should be excluded, and they were fighting for crown and empire. The war would change everything, because that secret group, plotting in the wings, and old Tom Clark's tobacconist shop in Parnell Square, meeting with what the RIC called Suspect McCullough and Suspect Hobson are planning a rising in the very heart of the war, and that Ulster aristocrat Roger Casement was on a mission to obtain arms and men from Berlin. He would arrive with the arms, he would be captured, he would later be executed. But by then, a rising had occurred, and of course, because of the executions,
Pierce and Connolly would triumph from their graves. In many ways, Carson had really relit the Fenian flame. And by 1921, two islands would emerge, whereas in 1912, a, a century ago, when this church had just been dedicated, um, a century ago, home rule seemed to be in the offing. Thank you very much. So thank you very much again, Eamon, for that beautiful talk. You could listen to them all night, isn't that right? We'll just take a short break now, so you can walk around the church. You can join us on the corridor for a cup of tea, a cup of juice. The toilets are there as well. Feel free to go outside. And we'll come back in about 15 minutes' time, and we will reconvene with question and answer sessions. Any comments you want to make yourself? <laughs>